Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Jesus cares about every single little minute little detail about their life. And if only people would recognize Jesus as their God, they could find hope. There would be someone to hear their prayers. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter number 1. Verse 45 to 49. I don't know how it happened, but a lot of the songs that were sung just during this afternoon service speaks of this one topic that we'll be talking about today throughout this message. The title of the message is Greater Things to Come. So first, no, sorry, John chapter 1, verse number 45 to 49 says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said, uh, saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto, unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Now look at verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Hope and anticipation are very powerful things. And honestly, there is more and more of a lack of hope in our day and age because, well, we've gone through a lot. Society has gone through a lot. And the world is only getting worse and worse. Uh, there was a story I read a couple of years ago about this young man named uh, Alex Kearns. He was a young man with hopes and dreams of wanting to get rich and successful. And just like any other graduating young man, he was wanting to do more with his life. He was attending the University of Nebraska, and during his sophomore year, he was told he had to leave the dorm and stay with his parents because it was the beginning of COVID-19. Well, like everyone else, being confined to home space, it and kind of encouraged him to look to his screens more and more. He started spending more and more time on his computer and his, uh, his phone. And the thing is, Alex, he was a nice guy. He talked with his parents. He wasn't antisocial or anything. He was a very good kid. And his parents would talk with him. His siblings would talk with him. And he would spend time with them. They would play board games here and there. But, you know, there's only so much you can talk when you're confined to a space 24-7 with your loved ones. And, uh, you know, Alex started noticing this as well. But sooner or later, he started to explore the Internet. And what he found was trading and investing websites. And just like many other young guys at his age, he was going into business at University of Nebraska, so he thought, well, maybe this is my way in. This could be something I could grow from. So, Alex started investing. And he was using this app. There was an app that was developed back in the day. It's not there anymore, as far as I know. But this app, apparently, gives you fake money so you could use it in the stock market and try and do some trades on your own and learn how the stock market works. So Alex decided, okay, well, I'm going to try and learn this. And he got really good at it. It was using real algorithms used in the stock market to figure out how things work. And Alex, he was learning more and more how to invest. So he thought, if I'm this good with fake money, how hard could it be with real one? So what he did was he took the money he had sort of saved up from birthday presents and things like that. 
And he decided, well, I'm going to start investing with money that isn't really mine, per se. So he started investing and investing. He got so good that he was starting to see his actual money grow, which was natural during the pandemic, because if you remember, the stock market crashed, and then it was starting to pick back up. On June 11, 2020, Alex pulled up his phone to read a notification from this specific app. What he found was that his account became restricted all of a sudden. He wasn't allowed to make any kinds of trades. And sooner or later, he looked at his portfolio that same day, and he found out that he now owed $730,000. He has... His, the stock market crashed all of a sudden, according to his app. And on his portfolio, he owed $330,000, and he had to pay it up, or else he was going to be arrested. Now, Alex, he, th he knew there was something wrong. There's got to be something wrong here. So he sent off a few emails to the customer service of this app. Um, he sent the email. And the customer service replied, but it was an automated message. And the automated message said, we've received your reply and we'll be right back with you in a moment's notice. Well, at this point, Alex is anxious. He can't do anything. And he can also see the numbers increase and increase on his debt. And in his portfolio, he is in trouble. He didn't want to tell anyone, but he just kept looking at his phone all day. Night eventually came. He sent another email to the customer service. Same type of email came back to him as a reply. Well, Alex, he didn't know what to do. His portfolio, he can see, it was, it was horrible. And this really started to bother Alex. He couldn't sleep. And one last time, around 3 o'clock or so, he sent one last email. And the reply came back. It was an automated message. We've, re we've received your reply, and we'll be back with you shortly. Then one more email came from the app customer service and said, you are in debt, and your first payment has to be $170,000. Otherwise, they will take legal action against him. Alex, ashamed, confused, didn't know what to do. So he went to his laptop, he opened up Microsoft Word, and he started writing his letter. He started writing, and then he took a screenshot of his enormous debt on his portfolio of his bank account on this app. He wrote that long letter, then he got on his bike, then he went to a train track, and then next day, the police officers came to the parents of Alex and asked and told them Alex had jumped in front of a train and had committed suicide. The saddest part about this story, 24 hours after Alex's last email, after he decided to start writing that letter, 24 hours after, Keep in mind, during the pandemic, nobody was in an office to answer an email. 24 hours later, they received, he received on his email inbox the letter that said it was a glitch. You don't owe anything. Alex's parents sued the app company, and they pled that if only someone was there at the help desk that day, Alex would have lived if there was someone that cared about what Alex had to say. What we have happening in our story is Philip finds his good friend Nathaniel, which we could almost presume was his best friend, actually, and he showed him Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, the question would come to us is, what would we do if we saw the Savior? You know, this is the Savior we had always sung about, we had always talked about, we read in our Bibles, but what if we actually saw the Savior? Because this is what happened with, 
with Philip here, right? And what would happen if we met Jesus Christ in person? How would you have reacted if you were in Nathaniel's place? This is the one who gives us hope. Now, in our story, I want to see three different statements that are made in our story that can lift up our spirit, that will show us hope. Where is hope in our day and age? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for everyone here. And Lord, we're so grateful for the food and the fellowship that we can have here in your house. And Lord, we're grateful for the hope you show in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be encouraged by what you have to say in your word. Lord, we pray that we, just like Nathaniel, just like Philip, would understand what it really means to have hope in you. I pray, Father, if there is somebody who is feeling perhaps anxious or depressed, not in their right mind, I pray, Father, that you would give them hope, show them what it means to know Christ. I thank you and praise you, Lord. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing we see is that Jesus saw. So in John chapter 1 and verse number 47 and 48 here, take a look here. It says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and saith unto him, Before that Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Truth is, Jesus knows all about us. Jesus knows all about us, and we can talk to him. We can talk to him. In Nathaniel's case, he was amazed at what Jesus said. How did Jesus know that he was under the fig tree? It's because it's possible that the whole time Nathaniel was under the fig tree praying. It's possible that that's where his prayer closet was, under that fig tree. And so when Jesus came by, he was the only person who would have known. We can trust Jesus. We can trust God because he cares for us. These days we have more friends than we have friends, right? And oftentimes we have certain topics, we talk with certain friends, but then the, the small group of people that we can really talk about, deep conversations, things that actually bother us, there's a very small group of people we can do that with. But the truth is, Jesus is the real friend. Jesus Christ is the one person that knows what you're going through. He's the one person you can always talk to and tell how you feel. There's a hymn that was written, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. That hymn was written by a man named Joseph Scriven. He was, a, he was an Irish man, and he was engaged to a young lady who lived in Ontario. But the problem was, one day, that his fiance drowned in Lake Ontario. In hearing the news, he started writing poems. He started writing about how much of a hope he found in Jesus Christ. And his mom, who was worried for him, wrote him a letter, but then this is what he answered back with. What a friend we have in Jesus. Scriven understood that day that you can only find hope in Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one who cares more than any of us could. He's the only one that can really love us. And we even know how much Jesus cares for us because We can take a look at it in Matthew chapter 10. Let's look there. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 31. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. It says here, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them, 
shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered, are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than, a, than many sparrows. Even Isaiah 49, verse 15. Let's turn there. Isaiah 49. Verse 15. It says, Can a woman forget her sucking child when she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? It's a rhetorical question. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Isn't that amazing? Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Never should a human being ever say that God never loved them. Because we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave himself for every person on earth. He was willing to shed his own blood for us. Jesus is the only God who bothered to show himself to people. Jesus claimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's John 14, 6. You know, I'm very grateful to be in Canada. I'm very grateful that we have religious liberties in Canada. But because of religious liberties, we also have room for error. And it kind of breaks my heart when I see, when I walk around Surrey, and I see temples that are open, and there are people that go to temples thinking they will find hope there and then come out. And then they live their life as if nothing had happened. And the truth is, yeah, nothing did happen. There are children like Alex who hide their sorrow, their shame. They don't want to show their debt to their parents. And one day they will eventually die or commit suicide. There are mothers who struggle to find their, the financial means to sustain their families. There are fathers like that too. There are moms in this city who will turn to their wicked ways to try and get some money just for their families. There are fathers who will sell drugs and will do things that are not very legal so that they can provide for their families. A lot of them are religious or perhaps irreligious. But they're not going to find hope in these different temples. It's sad because it's like if when they go to a Gurdwara or when they go to a temple and they pray, it's as if there is really no one on the other side to reply because they're not talking to a real God. There is no one to hear their prayers or respond to them. Jesus cares. There's a verse in Psalm chapter 140, 142, verse 4. It says, I looked on my right hand and, I, and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. This feels like a little prayer from one of the people that would go there. No one cared for my soul. Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Jesus cares about every single little minute little detail about their life. And if only people would recognize Jesus as their God, they could find hope. There would be someone to hear their prayers. So, without a doubt, Scripture makes it clear Jesus cares. And I think I'm getting that across to you too. Jesus cares. And He cares about everything we do in our lives and he cares about us. But I want to get into point number two. Jesus is also king. So not only does Jesus love us, but Jesus is also in control of everything that is there. I had read a story about this one missionary who was in Brazil. And while he was in Brazil, this had taken place. He was talking about how he lived in this area called Sao Paulo. While in Sao Paulo... He, it was during this time where Sao Paulo was considered one of the da most dangerous cities to live in 
in the world. So he was living in this city called Sao Paulo, and this missionary, he was scheduled to talk at one of the schools that was in that area. Well, here's the thing. One of the missionaries, or one of the members of this missionary's church told him, uh, Pastor, if you're, going, if you're traveling anywhere, uh, if you ever see two men on a motorbike, try and get away from that as soon as possible, because those are gangsters, and they will try to take as much as they can from you. So the, uh, this missionary, he went to the school, he spoke there, then he came back, and on his way back home, he was on a highway, and all of a sudden, two guys on a motorbike started showing up. By the way, this was not at nighttime. This was in broad daylight in the afternoon. Two guys started showing up on motorbikes, and they were starting to follow this missionary down the highway. Missionary kind of started suspecting there's something wrong here, and he's moving a little further down this highway, and then another bike shows up. And then sooner or later, there are seven or eight motorbikes now following this one missionary's car. And the missionary's thinking, I think I'm going to die. But then he started praying in his head. And then one of the motorcyclists did one of these things, you know, to roll down your window. And the missionary said, we want your car. And the missionary's going... Uh, no, no. But then a couple of minutes later, these guys who were at first going to rob this missionary of his car started backing off and backing off and backing off. And eventually, the missionary got home safely. Nobody really knows what really happened. But after, it was after that missionary started to pray that he started to realize that he was going to be okay. God was in control of that situation. God was in control of any situation. We may be going through many whirlwinds right now, but we don't really have anything to fear. Because when we see the big picture the way God sees it, God can intervene any time. Remember, He cares for you. God cares about us. Jesus cares about your life. We just need to trust him. We just need to trust him. Similar to Nathaniel. We need to understand, by the way, what was going on in Nathaniel's life at that point in, in, the, in history. Understand that Jerusalem and Judea, those areas were starting to be taken over by a nation named the Romans, right? And there was the Roman government and there was the Judean government. So if you were like the one guy who was in that area, you had to pay tax to one guy, then you had to pay a tax to another guy. Whenever something went wrong, they would bounce problems off each other and nothing would ever be taken care of. It was a very bad time in Judea. So they were hoping that there's this Messiah who, was, who has come, the, this Jesus Christ, would actually take away this problem. That was the whole mindset. This was a time when there was so much social unrest. Your neighbors can turn against you if they knew that there was money to be made. That's how bad it was. So Philip, he recognized this Messiah. And then he told his friend, Nathaniel, I found a solution. Come and see. Come and see. So if you're in John here, John chapter 1, verse 45 and 46 says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of, G of Joseph. And Nathanael saith unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Come and see. And then Nathanael, it is 48 and 49, but Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and saith, said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And it didn't take long for Nathanael to believe. 
It didn't take too long because all it took was Jesus telling Nathaniel that he saw him praying. And then Nathaniel's like, if I was praying to God and you knew that, you must be God. God in the flesh. We can probably think back at a time when God intervened in our life as well. Perhaps there was a time when you were going through sorrow and you were going through heartache, but then God intervened and then God came into your picture and then God, the grace of God came in and saved you. He brought us out of the problem. See, it's important to understand what king of Israel means because it's a title, king. When you understand, actually Pastor White talked about this this morning as well, the sovereignty of God is very much interconnected with what we call the king. The king is the sovereign. And what that means is they essentially have control. That's what it's talking about. That term sovereign is sometimes skewed today to mean something else. But in essence, it's speaking of how God has the full capability and control. If we spoke of an earthly king, that king would be allowed to do anything they wanted in a kingdom. So then, you ask yourself, okay, God knows everything. God has full control of everything. Then you could ask yourself, then why do I go through so much struggle? Why do I go through so much troubles in life? Why do I have to suffer? And to be honest, I can't give you the answer because it's a very difficult question. But there is one thing we can be sure of. Let's turn to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Why the troubles? Why the struggles? Jesus Christ, our King, wants faith full servants. Try and, trials and troubles are there to make stronger Christians. That's what it's for. Take a look at verse 28 all the way to 30. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. God wants to make a faithful Christian, a Christian that's full of faith. He is in control of our situations. And through him, our problems can be conquered. If you're in Romans 3, 8 there, Look at verse number 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Remember, Jesus still cares for you. He hasn't stopped caring after you accepted him as your Lord and Savior. He still cares for you. And he wants to make you a stronger Christian. He wants to make you more like him so that any trial that comes, you can conquer it. We have the King of Kings in control. So that also points to our bright future. And that's number three. Point number three, our bright future. Go back to John. John chapter one. Back to our jumping verse. It says here in verse 50 and 51. And I can imagine as Jesus is talking to, uh, to Nathaniel, he's kind of talking it in a, in a kind of funny kind of way. Because Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Can you imagine what we will be seeing after this life is over? We'll be seeing all these things happening before us. There's a missionary, and you may have heard of him, Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary to Burma. 
He was a great missionary. For the first seven years of his ministry, he didn't see many saved. But at the end of his ministry, he saw only 17 people in his congregation. And it's, by our standards today, that's kind of uh, pathetic, maybe. But Adoniram Judson wrote this on his diary, his prayer diary. The future is as bright as the promises of God. The future is as bright as the promises of God. What Jesus almost humorously asked Nathaniel is, you believe me just because I knew you were under the fig tree? Kind of naive, Nathaniel, you know? <laughs> like, you already believe me? But it's true. Nathaniel was full of faith at that day. He understood we need to have faith. Folks, it's true. We can open our Bibles and we can read story after story after story of Christians that have come and gone, of people who've lived for God. In Hebrews chapter 11, there, this is something that Christians often call the hall of faith. But when you read story after story after story, what you will read is people who are getting killed for their faith. What you will read is people who got persecuted for their faith. But then you get to Hebrews 12, chapter 1 and 2. Let's turn there one more time. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, in life, there are going to be a lot of disappointments. But knowing that God cares for you in every single way possible, that can give us faith and give us hope for what is come, coming for us in the future. Jesus is waiting for us at our finish line. He's waiting for us. So he's waiting for us to finish also well. So let me conclude the matter. By faith, we know that Jesus cares for us. By faith, we know that when something happens to us, Jesus would still be in control of that situation. Often we know faith comes from God, and we get it when we read our Bibles, right? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We read our Bibles, we get more faith. But faith is also like a muscle. You have to use it in order for it to grow and grow and grow and grow. Many of you this morning, have graduated from Soul Winners Academy. What will you do with that knowledge now? Jesus said, to whom much is given, much will also be required. You've been taught how to soul win. Could we expect you to come next Saturday? What Jesus came to give was the gospel of hope, and then he gave it to us to give to others. Also, what are we doing with it? What are we doing with the gospel of hope? You know, we have photos of missionaries all around our auditorium right now. But those are heroes that are bringing this same message, this same gospel of hope to others as well. Our faith grows when we faithfully give and support them. But did you also know that we still need missionaries here in Surrey. That's where you come in, soul winners. Did you know that there are kids and young teenagers that are still looking for acceptance in the wrong places? There are young girls who think they can get rich by flaunting their bodies on social media or putting it up on videos. There are young men who get in trouble thinking they can hurt their families and get away with things because they think they're right for doing so. 
And yeah, I'm not kidding you, that's happening in Surrey too. There was one day that I was walking, or I, sorry, let me back up a little. I was working at church here, and we were doing the security cameras. It was starting to get pretty late at night. And as I was working and I was starting to get cranky, I really wanted to go home. And there was a time when I lived a lot, lot closer to church, but it was, it was nice back then. I would drive home. But as I was driving, I finally turned into the parking lot. And as I turned into this parking lot, this was where I was getting close to my house. I was going down the driveway, 10 kilometers an hour. And then there was this young guy and this lady beside him. And they were walking in towards my direction. And I thought, I didn't think too much about it. I just kept driving. I wanted to get home. <laughs> I just wanted to sleep, honestly. But as I was driving, and as I was going very slowly, this guy started coming at me like this. And I'm going, what is wrong with this guy? I nearly miss him. And then I accelerate just a little more so I can get out of the way. But now I'm cranky. And something's going on in my head because I was like, I can't think straight. But, you know, I, I try to be nice. And I turn to him and say, hey, I almost hit you. What's wrong with you? And I got out of my car. Now this guy, he's about six foot three. He's coming at me. And I can smell the alcohol. And then I started realizing, oh, what have I done? And as he's coming towards me, I, you know, for a moment I'm thinking, you know what? I don't want to get into a fight. I'm just going to try and leave. Well, too late for that. That boat sailed. <laughs> this guy is coming at me, and I'm looking at him straight in the eyes because I didn't want to show him like I'm, I'm afraid of him now, right? But I am also aware that pastors aren't supposed to be strikers and brawlers, you know? So I'm looking at him, but then I can see this lady who was beside him. This woman was his mom. And the guy, finally, after he was getting closer and closer, I can see through the darkness, this is a young guy. He must have been like 16 years old. He was drunk. And the mom, about five foot two maybe. She was already in tears. What was happening is that she was bringing her child home. And now here's a guy who just instigated a brawl. And I started looking at this guy and this guy had already grabbed me by the collar and he was about to punch me. He was about to give it to me straight in the face. And at that moment, I had no more adrenaline left and all I was thinking about this mom, I felt so bad for this mother. She was crying. And she was saying, go, 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 because he's drunk. It just reminded me of the verse in Proverbs that says that a mother's heavy heart is when the child is being disobedient. We need missionaries in Surrey. I don't know where this guy is. But when I got home, I prayed for the guy. I never saw him ever again. But it was a sad story because the mom was in tears. And this guy, well, who knows where he's at now? He's gotten already a taste of alcohol. His life, we don't know what would have happened to it. But you see, no amount of government programs will set people free. There's no hope in programs. There's no hope in the amount of education you will give somebody. No amount of education will fix morals in a person. Only Jesus can fix that. Only Jesus can fix it. And the truth is, you can only be a first-time visitor once. And we have had many first-time visitors in our church. But how many of them 
have come through those doors hoping to talk with someone, to give them a little bit of hope, to make a friend perhaps, and then left, not having had anyone talk with them. Faith also grows when we pray and we know that He hears us. You see, folks, our life's conclusion is not here yet. Our life isn't over. We're still here for a while, and until the rapture happens at least. Wouldn't you like to tell Jesus that you did as much as you can to make a friend out of a first-time visitor? Wouldn't you like to be able to tell Jesus that when, you came, when it came to ministering, you did it the best you can? Wouldn't you like to tell Jesus that you tried to become a friend to an unsaved person so that you can one day lead them to Christ? Wouldn't you like to say that when you were able to go door knocking, you did your best to come? That when it came to offerings, that you gave it towards missions because you believed in a gospel of hope. So my question to you right now is, will you be a Philip and tell others about Jesus? Will you be a Nathaniel and pray? Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word. Thank you.